Yo, what's up? What's Welcome. good, Darren? How are you, man? I'm, doing I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Welcome to the new episode, Fantastic. the new season we're having here, oh, the realm of Darren. You know, to everybody who don't know who I'm, who I'm sitting next to, I'm sitting next to my dear, really dear friend and Saudi Arabia's first international movie superstar, Abdullah Ali. Thank Welcome you. for being here. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You know, you know. Before we get started, we're talking about so much, man. There were so many things that I wanted to share with you. Do you remember the episode that we did with? Um, we, I actually did an episode with your brother, yeah, Muhammad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Just uh, I think it was last year. It was a bit fast, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's been yeah. it's been a minute. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like he's telling you all about the secrets of the ninety nine names of Allah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a, that's a very it's a very rejuvenating <laughs> experience. It is, it is. And yeah. I remember the first time we met. Um, well, not the first time, but the after COVID, we uh, we you took us you took us to dinner, which was very nice of you. You took my brother and I, and um, in the car, you did sort of tell us a story about. No, my brother told you a story about his experience with the 99 names of, of, of Allah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, I think that's, that was the first time that uh, I think he spoke yeah. to you about it. And interestingly, it was on the first time we ever met after COVID. Yes, yes. So those we don't know, we met actually before you turned 18, right? It was like it was. It yeah. was one. I had one of the. Sh- I had a show mm-hmm. in downtown Toronto, yeah. and then we tried to get you in, yeah. but then you were underage at that time. I know you were seventeen or eighteen oh. years, right? Oh yeah, you um, were performing. Um, I think one of it wasn't. I don't know if it was one of your first performances, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it was. Um, it was a performance that you invited me to, and um, I think yeah. You know what's interesting is, um, that was my first time ever. You know. Being invited to such a performance, oh yes, and um, you know, at the at the door, they asked for my ID, but I uh, I didn't have ID at the time. I don't remember you, so, you, you had you had no beard back then. You had yeah, no mustache, no, beard, no, no facial hair, no mustache too. Uh, yes, yeah. you were you were as <laughs> as beautiful as like some Renaissance painting. You know, uh, it was you. it was like thank that. You, you know, it's very nice. Of you. Yeah, I mean, time flies. I mean, that was what twenty. 2019 prior to covid yeah time. yeah 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 i yeah. know uh, i know man yeah yeah almost you know yeah. we almost had michael got you in you know so huh? michael almost got you in, in that way yeah 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 yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> exactly it's um but you know what's i think you know i mean there's only three four friends of mine that that i've known since mm-hmm. since uh 2019 you oh, know, really? Meaning, I from UFT. Okay. And you're one of them, and I'm glad our friendship still exists till today. So I was honored because when I when I first met you, you told me you're a director. You know. Did I? And and then I wanted to see some of your film, uh-huh. right? And then and then you showed me. Uh, yeah. You were very resistant to show me Boy King at that time. You know. Yeah. No. Um. When was that? At the first. 2019. 2019. It was 2019. Yeah. I think so. We met at the Entrepreneur Hub. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, and basically, at the time is, wait, sorry, is a mic working? Is it all good? Mike is is Mike is good. Mike good. Mike is good. Mike's good. Do you mind if I just? Um, okay. oh, I didn't. Mm-hmm. I didn't check my hair all this time. So I was just <laughs> no, it's, it's all good. It's all um, good, bro. So we met basically at. Um, we met at the Entrepreneur Hub, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, our, I don't know, so do you recall what happened? It was just, I asked for your charger. Okay. <laughs> it was a UTSC, right? Yeah, it was UTSC. Okay, okay. okay. Um, I asked for your charger, mm-hmm. and then uh, you gave me Michael's charger. <laughs> and then Michael came to me, and he was like, whose charger is this? <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I think I told you I'm in the like the movie business or uh, like I'm in the film industry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I didn't. I don't mm-hmm. think you've watched it since. But I know you did watch it two years ago, 
or one year? No, one, last year. Last, last year, year. Last year, you wanted to set up a private screening yes. for us. Yes. Um, but it was it was just hard to get the get the venue going, yeah, get yeah, the yeah. Tire, get the guest list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you send me the Vimeo. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I really want to watch on an actual film screen. Oh, for sure. I think that serves it. You know. For sure. Yeah. For sure, we have mm-hmm. to do that. But spe- speaking of that, man, I was, yeah. I was wondering, like, so yeah. when I first met you, man, for those who don't remember, like, mm-hmm. Abdullah was like a little, like, you look like, you, look like, you always look like at the baby face. Man. <laughs> like, I call, he's, I call, we call him the baby face assassin, man. It's like Steph Curry. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that one. <laughs> but like, what is it like, man, yeah. to be like, to start your acting career, like, yeah. before you turn 18, essentially? Yeah, so no, it was actually when I was 16, um, you know, I was just a student um, studying at, uh, back in Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, where I lived my whole life. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was a normal kid, just like any kid, uh, you know, had a few friends. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I didn't have necessarily a friend group. Um, I faced I faced bullying at the time. Um, and it was interesting and, um, it was grade 10 when my whole life sort of changed a bit. Um, you know, I, for me, like I, you know, personally was, was bullied quite a bit at the, at that American high school. Um, it wasn't necessarily physical, but more verbal. And, um, you know, I was a bit sensitive, of course, right? Because for me, I, I sort of, um, I, I was always, as a kid, I never really liked school. Mm-hmm. I remember my parents, my mom, she used to sort of drag me out of school, drag me to go to kindergarten. Grade one was very tough. I think I missed like almost one third of the school year, in grade one. And then for kindergarten, I probably missed half of this or more than half, maybe. It's just, I, you know, I think what it was is basically like I was, um, my mother, I remember she used to really make me, um, she used to really talk really great about school before I started going in KG1. And um, I think she, she really, um, really <coughs> made me excited for going to school. But then what happened is when I went the first day, I think I was like, oh, this is this what it's all about? And I think I wasn't too impressed or too uh, excited to further going to further go every day. Um, so then so grade two, grade two, grade, grade two, grade three, I, I homeschooled. And then I ended up. I preferred homeschooling, to be honest. Wait, so you were skipping school? No, in like so, 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 yeah, yeah. Really, like I, I skipped like probably more than half of the school year, or half probably. How did you do that? Um, I just used to tell my mom, "Oh, I'm feeling sick. I don't want to go." Okay. Um, but then as I grew older, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, my throat is hurting. <laughs> I can't go. But. Um, but then basically what happened is um, in grade, in, in so I, I, I did homeschooling in grade two and three. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wasn't too very fond of going necessarily every day to school. And, you know, I just never, I never felt like I fit, fit it in. I really never felt like I fit in. I used to have like maybe one or two, three friends, mm-hmm. uh, but not necessarily. Everyone sort of had a friend group and I was never part of a friend group. Um, so I maybe had a best friend and then I had a couple, one, two other friends. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do recall, you know, uh, you know, bully experiences in my grade one and maybe that's why I didn't like it too much. Um, but then in grade, in grade nine and grade, in grade nine and grade 10, when I went to high school, Mm -hmm. It was a very new experience because all my life I went to a, uh, you know, um, in Saudi Arabia, there's international schools. There's obviously government schools. And then there's like you have the British international school, you have the American international school. So you went to international school. I went to the international schools. Then Mm -hmm. I went, I transitioned to the American international school. And the American international school is like known to be one of the best in the kingdom, if not 
That's in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's like the top five schools basically. Okay. And okay. um and you had um you know, so it was, this one was mixed, right? So um it was a very new experience going to a mixed school, mixed mm-hmm. gendered school okay. as well. And um also oh, like not all school in Saudi Arabia had the f- same gender. No, no. Uh, so just the very like I said, the British or American or the French, for example, they're mixed, mm-hmm. but otherwise it's just one gender. Wow. So if you go to a local school in Saudi Arabia, it will be one gender school. Correct. For kids, even to yeah. today? Even till today. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Even till today. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a very new experience. I then, you know, faced, unfortunately, a bit of verbal bullying in grade eight and nine at this new high school. Um, but in grade 10, what my brother advised me to do, and um, he was learning from Bob Proctor at the time, mm-hmm. who was who's known to be America's greatest prosperity coach. He just passed away, I think, two years ago. Um, may God rest his soul. And so what happened was, is basically my brother, you know, uh, he authored a book at age 19 about uh, self, you know, the, uh, you know, how to become the master of your own mind. This is really like a self-help book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he started sharing with me certain stuff you can apply in your life today as a grade 9, 10 student. And, and one of them was like, hey, Abdullah, you know, you should take theater class to help with your confidence in, in, in school and whatever, just help with your natural confidence. So I took theater class just for the idea of, you know, listening to my brother. So I took theater class. And at the time in Saudi Arabia, there were no theater classes because you you have to remember there was no cinemas back in the day prior to 2018. So when I was in high school, it was like around 2016. Can you expand a little bit on that? How come there is no cinemas? What do you mean by that? So um, it's so hard for somebody, you know, in a Western audience, which is yeah. in general to understand that. Yeah. So there was sort of, um, you know, uh, post 1979 in the kingdom there was a new sort of um saudi arabia took on a a new form of islam more of a very conservative approach of looking at islam and hence um they deemed cinemas um to be you know you know not spreading spreading the best moral uh, values to their audi- to the local population, so thus they banned uh, cinemas in the country. So wow, yeah, okay. yeah. So were there any movie before that? Uh, well, there was one thing. There was the you know um, NBC, okay. the Middle Eastern Broadcasting Corporation. Now they produce uh, TV shows in the kingdom. Um, they produce a lot of shows during Ramadan. So there's that. But in terms of movies, I mean, there's always, you know, maybe small independent ones like in the past that, you know, maybe someone quietly illegally making a movie. But there's no regulatory f- framework to make a movie in, in the kingdom. And, you know, at, and it's even sort of illegal to do such a thing. Um but there was TV shows. Now, the concept of performing arts in schools, you know, that teach acting and all that, or even theater class in school was, was not a thing. So me taking theater class at the time in 2016 in Saudi Arabia was probably one of the fewest, one of maybe 10 or one of under, under 20 for sure in the whole kingdom. And the theater teacher, David Bialik, who was the theater teacher at the time. Uh, he was very well known in the kingdom because, you know, he's he's an American theater uh, teacher and he's very talented. Um, and normally, you know, I had, so because, you know, there's hardly any theater classes at the, t- at the time. So his, his work was extremely valuable. So he was teaching at the American school and um, I learned later on that uh, you know, I had dinner with him after my movie and stuff. I wanted to thank him. And he told me that, you know, uh, in the in the field of, uh, you know, theater studies, 
if you get more than, I believe the number was 10 students uh, to become professional actors, um, you've made it as a theater coach, like as a theater teacher. Mm -hmm. Now, can you imagine that he, teaching in the kingdom, his students in the kingdom alone, he had mm -hmm. 12 successful professional actors that came out of his class. Professional, and, and they're on Netflix, they're on Amazon, they're in uh, Disney, they're everywhere. So just to sort of pay respects to, to, to pay respects to how great of a teacher he was, mm -hmm even though when there's no theater classes in the whole kingdom, mm -hmm. he was able to produce 12 successful professional actors. And when you say his name was again? David Bialik. David Bialik. Yeah. So your mentor, you, one of your first mentors. My first acting mentor, for sure. Oh, so this, uh, this mentor, this guy, David Bialik. Yeah. yeah. He goes, to, he's American. He's American. And he goes to Saudi. Yeah. Uh, when did he get there? I'm not sure, but okay. he, he, I think he worked in the kingdom relating to theater for the past maybe 20, 15, 20 years, I think. Okay. I so think. He, wow. So he goes there and then he produces essentially the first batch of modern day Saudi Arabian actors. Yeah. And not necessarily uh, Saudi. They, they are, you know, international, like okay. different countries. So mm -hmm. one is American, for example. Mm -hmm. Others are from different countries because at the international school, you have all sorts of different kids, right? I see. You have I Japanese, see. you have Chinese, you have Americans, you have French, mm -hmm. you have every, everyone sort of. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. And while you're in that international setting, yeah. you know, that's where you really start developing theater and acting and picking it up and really, yeah. when was that, you know? So what happened is when I first got to theater class, he asked all the students to uh, project or scream their name and where they're from the loudest. So what I did uh, at the time is, well, this was my first ever theater class, I got on the table and I stood on the table and I, I screamed my name as loud as I could have. And um, I didn't think much of it, but um, he had a daughter in my class and another class of mine. And his daughter told me that, you know, my father spoke very highly of you because he's never came across a student that went on you know, the table <laughs> and scream their name out. Um, so it was, it was nice to hear that. But, um, but then I went on, you know, and then he came out with sort of like a ranking. I guess he, he used to do that. He used to have like ranking of uh, the different students in his theater classes and who's the best from all the classes he teaches. He told me I've tied fifth. So then after class, he told me, hey, why don't you try out to play in my next theater play? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Wizard of Oz, for example. And uh, I wasn't really interested because at the time, it was just to, you know, learn confidence. It was, you know, nothing else. So I, I, I just said, oh, okay, you know, I'm, I'm trying to just focus on my grades and my school right now, but uh, I'll consider it. Um, but that that happens, and then one day I, you know, I get to theater class, and he, he, um, in front of the whole class in the beginning, he's like, "Dola," I'm like, "Yes," and he's like, "Would you be interested in acting in a Saudi film that's going to be filmed in London, United Kingdom? Kingdom, they're going to have different, uh, different um, child acting coaches for you, different tutors. You won't miss school." And of course, at the time, I always wanted to homeschool, right? So this was like the perfect opportunity. And, um, <laughs> and I was like, you know, I was so happy when he said that to me because I already, I already conceived that he, it's as if he selected me in this movie, although he was just referring to an odd, simple audition, but I you know, I misunderstood what he was referring to. So he, then I talked to him after class. He's like, why don't you contact uh, this man? His name's Abdullah. And I said, okay, I'll call. he's one of the producers or something. Um, so I then, you know, took his card back home and I, I, I met with my mom 
And I told her, hey, mom, I'm going to become an actor. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been selected, to, you know, in this movie. I have no idea what this movie is about, nothing. And, um, and my mom's like, you know, my mom's like really supportive, of course. You know, she was always... Uh, she always was uh, very supportive of any creative endeavors. So I give my mom the card. Um, you know, we we call the we call the producer, right? And he said, "Oh, okay. I just need some photos of you guys, and that's all." So I sent him a photo, and then he was on the phone with me and my mom, and he's like, "Okay, you know, there's some." There's some resemblance between, I see some resemblance between the young King Faisal and, and yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, at the time, I, I wasn't even aware of the full history of the young, you know, the King, King Faisal and his youth. And I wasn't aware because I wasn't taught that at school. So, um, so it's very interesting. So then he asked me to wear the Sally attire uh, to take photos of you in the Sally attire. And send. so the thing at the time is, I was, um, I didn't think much of it, right? In my head, like, I already sort of conceived that I already got the film. Like, I'm going to be acting. So when he asked me to do that, I procrastinated for some reason. I'm not sure. But I took around two weeks to send him the photos. And my mom's like, you know, she's always like, well, you got to do it now. You got And I was like, eventually, my mom, uh, uh, when I was having a day off out of school, she's like, she just forced me. She said, wear everything. I'm going to take you down, take some photos, photos of you in, in the garden. Um, so thanks to her, you know, I was pushed to, to take those photos and I, and then I submitted it to them. And then what happened was, is I didn't hear back for maybe one, two months. I'm not sure. Then one day, um, at the time I, I got, I had my phone with me, Samsung Galaxy S4. Okay. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> so the Samsung uh, Galaxy S4, I so my I didn't have much of a social life to be honest. Um, so I never used to get calls, but then I got a call. It said plus three four, and I saw this call and I was like, I was like what kind of scam artist is calling me with this international number? So I said, you know, for the sake of it, I'll just pick up. I'll see what the scam artist wants. So I pick up the phone and he's like, hola, Dula, this is um, Andres Vicente Gomez, uh, Oscar winning <laughs> producer. <laughs> we're, we're going to, uh, I want to talk to your mother about uh, this film. I'm like freaking out, right? So I give my mom the phone and, and he's like, um, uh, we, we need to meet with Abdullah, right? So I meet with the, um, I meet with the producer and I go with my parents and, uh, you know, my sister, I go, I go, I meet with him and, um, I was 16 at the time. So this, I met him basically in the city of Jeddah. Uh, he was visiting. So I met him and he, when he looked at me, he was like, the moment he saw me, he was like, no, you know, it, it's not going to happen. He said, look, you look too young for the role. Although you're 16, we're looking for a 14 year old. And at the time I, I look, I normally like, I look two years younger than my age or it's not three years younger. So when I was 16, I probably looked like I was 12 or 13. So, um, he's like, you, you know, we're looking for someone look like that looks like you, but just a bit older looking. He said the reason behind that is because although Prince Faisal was uh, 14 at the time when he visited London to, uh, you know, for the diplomatic mission, although he was 14 and frankly, he didn't look 14, right? It's not like he looked like he's 16 or 17. So he, but he was like, although, you know, he was 14 and he looked 14, we need someone older looking. So that Hollywood, when they watch this movie, they can believe such a young kid is meeting uh, Winston Churchill, Lord Curzon, the King of England. Because otherwise, he was like, they won't believe such a young kid is talking to such figures. So we need someone like you that looks like you, but a bit older. 
So I was, and then he said, look, I won't promise you anything. I'll, I'll, I'll promise you just an audition in the capital city. And, and, and that's all. But then I was going, I was, you know, with my family back home driving. I told my parents, like, you guys need to feed me as much as you can. <laughs> you, what, what, feed me as much as I okay, can. Okay. Give me, uh, like, I told them, like, this, I, like, I want a burger right now. Like, I wanted to somehow look older, I guess. Right. So I thought, I was like, okay, if I eat more, I might look older. So, so I had this sort of mindset that I wasn't taking no for an answer. And you know, when he was flipping, he was flipping through the uh, lookbook of the movie. As he was flipping through the, the pictures, I, I saw, I saw the young Prince uh, Faisal who was 14 at the time. And I myself, I saw like a starking, starking uh, resemblance to him. I, I didn't say it to him, but I saw myself. I was like, oh my God, I kind of look similar to him. Um, so, but I didn't express that to him. But then what happened is afterwards, we, uh, you know, uh, I didn't hear back from him for a week. He said, next week, I'll promise you an addition other than that. You know, I can't promise you anything. I didn't hear back from him from a week. And then I get this email. Um, I get this email. It said, um, Andres, he emailed me and he was like, he's like, Abdullah, I need you to be in London um, in, in two weeks for an audition with the director. I was, you know, I was, I was very excited, of course. And I told my dad and, He's like, you have school and stuff. So we went on a, we went on a long weekend. So, um, we went on a long weekend and, um, it was fun. It was like a, you know, like a, a like it was just like a free trip to England. Right. So why not? Uh, what's there to lose? Um, for me, I was excited. My whole thing was, you know, I have, I have to get it, you know? I have to try my best. So were you very determined to get the spot at that very, time? Very determined, but also I had a weird uh, conviction in my heart that it's for me. I don't know how to explain it. So it's a weird conviction. But although there was so many obstacles that logically it, it would, on paper, it would be impossible for me to get the role, like I myself, if I was in the position to choose the actor for this role, I wouldn't probably choose myself. Probably not. Why would you say that? I would choose myself, but <laughs> but the, on paper, I'm saying it doesn't make any logical sense. And um, yeah, on paper. Did you have any idea that you were, who are you competing with? So I had no idea. Okay. I had no idea. So I go to London and uh, the moment I arrive, you know, they pick me up from the airport and everything. And the production coordinator, she gives me a, two, a 130 page script. I've never read a script in my life. And uh, she's like, okay, you need to read all this. And tomorrow when you meet the director, you know, just know the lines and, you know, not all the lines, but certain, yeah, like 130 pages. You should have read the whole movie. And uh, there are certain scenes you have to memorize. So I never read a script in my life. I don't even know how to read a script. And I was very, um, very, um, I could say, sort of like, I was just very confused on what to do, very, kind of overwhelmed a bit. But then the next day, um, the next day, I meet the director, Augusti Villaranga. He's an award-winning European director from Spain. And I meet with him, and uh, we review the lines. And keep in mind, I've never acted in a school play. All I had was theater class, right? So the director is asking me to read the lines. And I was practicing with the fellow actor. And he's asking me to read it, and I'm just reading it as if it's 
as just like I would read a school textbook, right? It was like, no, I need you to feel it. I need you to express it. And I didn't frankly understand what he's talking about. I had no idea what he's talking about. But thankfully, my father, who um, who was there, he was um, taking like just sort of some videos from the side, to, just for like memory purposes. You yeah. know, uh, it's just a great experience to have been a part of this, even if I didn't get the role. So, so my father took a few videos, and um, the director was. Um, because they were supposed to start filming in a month. They were supposed to start filming in a month. And um, what has happened is, sorry, let me put my phone on silence. <laughs> so, they were supposed to start filming in a month. Now it's a $21 million production. USD. USD. Well, okay. And... The interesting thing is it's obviously there's a lot of pressure on the producers, on the director to find the right actor. This is a film about the Saudi royal family. This is Saudi Arabia's first ever feature film, international feature film in its history. Um, you know, so there's a lot of pressure, of course, on their heads. Um, so when I was working with the director for the first time, um, he was under... Heavy pressure, I'm sure, because they're starting to film in one month and they're yet to find the, the lead actor. So then I noticed um, he was very stressed because all I was is, was reading it like a textbook. I wasn't acting. And um, he was so stressed and I was so bad at acting that he used to go leave the room every 20 minutes for a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a really cool one. Huh? I guess, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 And um, every 20 minutes for a cigarette. And I'm not exaggerating. That's how bad I was as an actor. Um, but then but then after I um, reviewed the night, so that was just a pre, uh, sort of uh, just the first ever meeting, is a pre-audition, just to sort of get used to everything, um, is a pre-audition. So when I went home that night, I, I reviewed the videos, looking at, looking at the videos objectively from a third point of view, I understood what the director wants from me. I, I, I was able to understand. So I go in the next day, and this is like the audition. Now this audition, you know, uh, this audition will be reviewed by certain parties and they are to sign on if I am good enough to play the lead or not. So it was, it was there was some uh, sort of, ten, there was sort of a lot of pressure for sure. But, you know, I, I called my mom and, and she said, um, she said, uh, you know, just, you know, just uh, pray that, um, pray that you get the role. So I, I in the morning prior to the audition, I, I was praying and uh, then I went to the audition and um, I had the costume designers come in. We had the costume designers there. So there was uh, the French costume designer, Francois. She put on the whole Saudi attire and all that. And, um, and, and once I think you, as an actor, I think when you, once you put on the, you put on the costume, it, it really helps. Uh, it really helps. And uh, when you see yourself in with the costume, it's like, okay, I am him. Uh, so we went ahead with the audition. I had a child acting coach who was training with me prior to the audition there. His name is Benjamin Perkins. He's the acting coach of, I think, you know, he's very well known in Hollywood. He's, he's um, arguably one of the best, if not the best, child acting coach. Um, some of his students include Tom Holland Ooh, uh, of Spider-Man. Yeah. So I was very honored to, to work with him a bit prior to the audition. And um, what happened was, is basically we went for the audition and uh, the director, he looked at me, he's like, what happened? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, uh, you changed. Well, 
how did you, what did you do? What did you do last night? What? He was, he was really questioning. He's like, you improved, how? And I was like, um, I was like, no, I, I watched the videos of what you wanted and I, I, I was able to understand. And he was like, so we did the audition take and the first audition take, it was, he said, we don't need to film any more takes. <laughs> so I think that was a good sign. And I think in retrospect, as I look at it, I think he was able to see some improvement over a short span of time. So he's like, okay, it's possible with the right training, with the right direction, it might be possible for him to pull it off. So they were, you know, I finished the audition and everything. And then we had, we had the director of casting. We had the director, we have, we had the producer. We had a fellow actor, actor in the movie who was doing the scenes with me. You had the f costume designers. So we're down to five, now six, seven, eight. So we had like, in total, we had around nine people that day in the room. All of them, except my father and I, uh, they, le they, leave, they leave out of the room and they're talking for two hours. So they, two, they put you and your father in a room, in a room for two hours. <laughs> two hours. <laughs> two hours. <laughs> you know, as you, and obviously it's, they're talking about me and the performance and everything. So it's, it was kind of nerve wracking as I look back in the sense that like, you know, we, I don't know what exactly they were talking about, but I was very, um, I had a very positive view on it. Right. I had a very positive view on it. And hence, hence, um, yeah, I just want to oh, okay, no worries. You guys go ahead. Go ahead. Keep that happens. Well, you got to take all the audio. With, with the, with her. <laughs> the weather changes now. It's like I'm crying for her. <laughs> uh, Please, so yeah. put you and your father into two rooms, into one room together. Yeah, yeah. You know, can you imagine like, Let's let's say let's say you're uh, you're applied to a job, right? And you do the interview for uh, an oppor. It's going to be your first job, but at the same time, it's an opportunity that change would probably change the course of your life. So you have nine people interviewing you, and you're 16 years old, and they go ahead with the interview, and then they leave the room, and they talk for two hours without you. And you have to be in the room. <laughs> Can you overhear what they're saying the time? No, no, no idea. Okay. But to be honest, I wasn't concerned. I knew I did my best. And I think that's what all, that's what matters, right? If you do your best, you're at peace. And, um, but then the director came in two hours later and he saw, he looked at my face and he was saying something in Spanish. I still don't understand. And he's like, he pulled out a photo of uh, the uh, late Prince uh, Faisal at 14. Put it here and my face is here. He's like, he's like looking, he's like, he's like, there's a resemblance. And, um, and then, you know, they, they, uh, they send the audition to the decision makers. And, um, and, uh, and, and for now I, I knew I did my best. I'm, you know, I'm going to be flying in the next one, two days. Actually, tomorrow I'm flying, you know, back then, um, back home to continue school and everything. But I wanted to go to an Arsenal football match. It's my favorite team, okay. my dream to go. So I went, thankfully, with, with my father. And um, we went, uh, we went, we lost 3-0. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Then I, I I went back home. I went to back to Saudi Arabia. I continued school, and um, it seemed to me that um, that they you know that they that they wanted me. So you had a feeling at that time. I had a feeling, but also I sort of knew because they asked me to do a um, costume before my flight. Asked me to go to Angel's Costume House, which is known in the UK uh, to be one of the greatest. Uh, costume houses for film production and all that. <laughs> um, so then, uh, you know, I got fitted. They did the measurements and all that. So I think that was sort of an indication that they're really concerned me for the role, if not. Yeah. So, so you know, I came back 
home and uh and then you know my dad um my dad was very on the middle about this first he was like you know your school how you it's great tennis you know arguably one of the important years of high school so he's like you're, you know you're your school your university this is going to change everything this and that so you know why why would you want to do this i said to him i think this is uh, an opportunity for for me to serve my country and my people through this film and um so, but he was obviously in, in the middle. Um, in Islam, what you do is um, there's the, like for major decisions in life, you're advised to do uh, salat al istikhara, which means um, the prayer of uh, guidance. So you ask God, you ask God in the middle of the night before you sleep. Uh, you ask God for guidance. If it's best for me, then grant me it. If it's not best for me, take it away with ease. So my my father prayed that I prayed for that as well, and um, and thankfully it, it it worked out. Thankfully it worked out. So you got the role essentially. Essentially, you got a call or anything like that. No, I think my dad was in the conversation. My dad sort of hid away, hid the decision from me, and, until I was until he got confirmation from the school that I can take. <laughs> two two or three months off. Oh my god! So your dad knew. My my dad sort of knew. Mm-hmm. My dad knew. Mm-hmm. My dad knew. Um, but I think he hid it from me for like maybe uh, almost a week. But it's not too bad. I, so I, you know, obviously as a father, you have to sort of see what's best for your children. And I'm glad he was able to to uh, to do that. Very grateful. Yeah. So you're in it now. You're in. So to take me back there, you were. You what was it feel like when you know that this is happening? Um, I think it was. I think you know when you discover something you're really good at, but you was you weren't aware of it all your life. I think that's sort of a very life changing experience. Um, because I feel like at that time, when you're performing, let's say your God-given gift, as they say, you're at your highest level of performance and, you know, you're of your higher, highest self in essence as well. So it was a very uh, beautiful experience to feel that at a young age and to discover something I'm, 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 I'm a hidden talent that I never perceived. Uh, but if I look back at my earlier years in life, you know, I was always acting. I was always, you know, maybe in some classes I was a class clown. Um, you know, I was always imitating different accents to my family and friends. So I was always, always acting. Um, so I think when you discover that, it's it's a really a very, it's a really beautiful experience. I see. So, um, and this is when, uh, when with David. When was that? When so? When how how long did this whole thing take place? From you, from from when to when? So from you, like getting into just theater yeah. and then getting the role. I think that was a good, uh, maybe five months. Oh wow! So just it all happened in five months. Yeah, like until all these the events you just talked about until getting the role. Correct. Yeah. So from like just going into theater. Yeah, knowing nothing at all. Knowing nothing at all, and then to getting, uh, getting the role, getting the lead for Born and King. Yeah. Okay. Five months. Five months. Yeah, yeah. Would you say those five months really changed your life? Yeah, definitely, definitely. It was um, a very life changing experience. And you know, one thing I, I I think I learned throughout that process is is that with uh, divine timing, there's no. Uh, it's always there's always. Uh, you know, everything's happening, in my opinion, to a divinely planned sort of um, orchestra. And um, I noticed that, like, I realized, I was like, you know, how could I, if some, if the, if the Oscar-winning producer is asking me to send a video audition, 
why is it that I procrastinated for two months? It doesn't make any sense. Two weeks, bro. Two weeks. Two, two, two weeks. weeks. And then I did another two months. You get Procrastination. Nervous. Really? I wouldn't call it procrastination. I just, whatever it was, I, I don't know. I just didn't do it. And um, I, I look back at that as a very divinely orchestrated. So that you may not perceive it as such, or maybe you could label it as procrastination, or you could label it as as whatever. But I, how I look at it is it was a divinely sort of orchestra that God's plan, like, you know, I sent that video or that audition to the producer at a specific time. Maybe if I sent it a month before, maybe it wouldn't have been even considered. God knows, but so it's like, it's a very uh, interesting life lesson I sort of took from that period of my life as well. That's a really nice way to put it. It's like it really teaches you to be more in tune with like nature, with the spiritual and the divine at such a young age. Yeah. You know, looking back. <laughs> yeah. 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 But tell me more, man. So now you're, follow, you're in it. Mm-hmm. You guys are shooting in London. Yeah. So as I, I saw the movie. It was also some scenes were in the desert. So was it all shot in London? Or? Yeah. So we, we, we filmed um, sorry. 70% of it in, in the UK. Uh, so we filmed seventy percent of it in the UK, uh, which was all in English. Uh, so we spent a good uh, 60, sixty to seventy days, sixty-five days in of shooting. Um, but there was a month of three, four, three weeks of rehearsal. Oh, three okay. weeks. Of okay. So what is that like uh, that when was, you rehearse? That you was know? a very that was a very interesting uh, time because I was pushed uh, in the ocean, sort of. Um, very uncomfortable experience where, you know, um, you're being sort of uh, pushed to to bring that creativity out of you. And in a short span of time, a very rigorous schedule. You know, I had three weeks of... Uh, you know, waking up at 7 a.m., uh, at 7 to 9 a.m., horseback riding practice. Uh, then I had um, uh, one acting coach from, let's say, uh, 10 a.m. to uh, 1 p.m., 1 to 4 p.m. with the director and three other actors. Um, then from 3 to 7 p.m., I have uh, tutoring, for example. I, I would normally, ex- 7 a.m. to... 7, 8 p.m. is the normal days. So a good 16-hour shift on average. Uh, 13 to 16 hours. Yeah. So you did that for essentially three weeks? Three weeks, but then it, it obviously got much more intense when we started filming. Okay. How, how could it get more intense in that way? So um, during filming, you have, obviously, you have like, you have like 200 people on set right sorry you have 200 people on set where it's it's like so much energy on set it's insane and uh, everyone's working uh, you have to, you're on some a very rigorous tight schedule you know for us we took you know, we took 10 hours to film one minute because we had, you know, we had like all these different sets, um, you know, um, lighting, um, cameras, audio, everything takes time. And it's like, um, and then like, it's one thing as an actor, and then it's one thing I believe as like the lead actor, because as a lead, you're constantly need. You're in constant demand by everyone, um, by the costume department. By thankfully, I didn't need makeup, but makeup. Um, then you need, for example, you have like if you have an acting coach slash dialect coach. Um, you're in, they're always rehearsing the lines with you, the director. 
the uh, assistant director number you know the different assistant directors the um director of photography sometimes he wants you to stay in shot to just practice with the cameras before they shoot um the you know so there's this constant then pressure or constant demand of the lead actor um and not only that is when i had a break it would be my tutoring sessions because i have to still finish grade 10 you know i have to finish grade 10 so um during my breaks i had to study so it was uh, very very rigorous <laughs> I, i'm very glad it happened because i think it you know it taught me what i'm capable of yeah but what was it like working with uh working on that 10 hour scene like which mm. do you do you remember which scene it was yeah like um uh, like it, it might not necessarily be one scene but there could be for example three scenes where we shoot in the day and um and uh those three scenes are like um, like you know on average three to four hours per scene uh, but normally it took the whole day which is normally 10 hours 10 to 13 hours of filming to produce one minute of uh, content for the movie and um yeah yeah oh well, that's fine sounds really sounds like you didn't get much sleep yeah no uh, yeah. I, um thankfully when i got back home i was able to sleep but then when you get back home from such an energy intensive day you're like to wind down is something else it's like it's like uh like i, I used to remember like when I, when I came back home i i i guess it's like it requires so much energy to even talk i, I don't know if you, you probably experienced that too as a creative where it's like you're fully drained and uh and yeah so we were working six days a week five to six days a week on average five to six one day off it was, it was fun it was fun but then what is it like that for yourself to really step in that you're like wow this is a hollywood feature film like knowing that there is this pressure and there is this intensity that's being demanded of you this quickly yeah and then w working with the director himself you know Mm -hmm. Well, Villaronga, like he sees that okay, he can be improved very quickly. Yeah. Like, did you go in the way you you got out? Like, was what are what are the what is yeah. what do you think are the growth and the biggest challenges that you had? I think it was a very humbling experience because um, one thing is to balance um, uh, professionalism and. Uh, and work ethic and your attitude uh, and I think in the very first week it got to me all right because when you're on set as an actor you're treated like a prince you're treated like a king almost like a king everyone's you know uh Everyone's here to serve you, and it's you know someone's asking you what would you like to drink, what would, what food would you like, um, would you like this, would you like you can ask them anything, and and they would give it, sort of. Uh, everyone treats you with a lot of respect and all that, but also in the same. So I think for like beginners, I think uh, it it you know it, it it hits people's egos for sure. Like it it could. It could make one very arrogant, for example, right? Because now you're on top of the world, right? And um, I think for me, not only as a lead actor, you get that special, special treatment from everyone on set. Um, Frank, I would argue actors get better treatment than directors sometimes, right? So you get this special, special treatment as a lead actor as well. And then not only that is... You know, everyone's calling you king. Everyone's calling you prince, king, or whatever. They're treating you like royalty. So 
you know, as a kid, just in high school, getting bullied, and like a normal random kid, it you're like, this is a completely, this is just foreign to me, right? And uh, I remember in the first two days with the constant work, very tired, 13 hours. I think it got to me in the first three, four days. And um, like I remember the second day of shooting, um, we were all the way in uh, Southampton. Um, we were on the seas of, South, of Southampton. And and um, we, they made a beautiful sh sort of like a ship. They customized uh, a, a, a ship, not a ship, but like a very 1920s boat. Um, because at the time, in the 1920s, they didn't have airplanes, right? Or they didn't normally travel in airplanes. So Prince Faisal, he traveled on a boat to the United Kingdom. So we were filming the boat scenes. So... Now, this is like South, you know, the Southampton seas are known to be uh, brutally uh, windy and cold. So I was extremely cold, tired, 13 hours. And, and uh, it's a very distinct, uh, memorable experience I have on that day is um, I was taking, I was on a break, just finished shooting. So like I finished the scene, I went to my cabin for a good break. And then right when I got there, I think like a few minutes later, they called me back in on set. I was like, oh my God, I have to go again. And it's cold. It's so windy. So then I walk towards the camera. And then when I get there, I had a, a double. So like a stand and double where, you know, they're just, um, before I come on set, they're just getting the camera angles correct. So I had the stand and double and and basically, um, when I got there, it was a good like, good walk to get there. Then when I got there, it was like, the the, the director said, "No, no, I, we don't need you anymore." Or the, one of the director of photography is one of. So I was like, I was uh, I was I was annoyed. <laughs> I went I went I went like this and like in a very arrogant fashion, I I did that and I was like, very frustrated, arrogant fashion. I I sort of. Just, uh, I dismissed, like, I was like, I'm, I'm going back to the cap and I'm going, I'm going for my break. But then I was, as I was going, um, the director, he pulled me aside mm -hmm. and he said to me, look, do not lose yourself. Not lose yourself. Everyone is now treating you like this, like that. That doesn't matter. At the, at the end of the day, you're, you're Abdullah. You're a normal guy. Don't let it get to your head. And he gave me a nice, a nice sort of, um, it's like a, he reprimanded me, sort of. He put me in my place on the second, third day of shooting. And uh, I think that was sort of a very life-changing experience because I remember since then my attitude was, was much, much, much better. I went to him later, I apologized for my attitude. And I think that, that, uh, that you know, it's something that, stick that stuck with me ever since until today it's important i think to with the chaos to sort of you know manage yourself in a very humble fashion as well well because you're going through all that stuff right now you're you're doing all the training yeah no sleep basically yeah just working 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 mm -hmm. all of a sudden you know from being a high school kid and now you're just like you're getting the top of the top professional uh, excellence demanded out of you yeah. right and then but then at the same time you're being treated as a special royalty because yeah. you're the lead you're doing yeah. all that stuff yeah man that's, that must be a very like like it must be a like really dichotomous expression yeah. like thing you're going through right you, on one end you're like you know that this is you kind of like know it but like you're kind of getting yeah. sucked in you're into that right yeah you're enjoying that every time there's a set you're yeah. going through it that's really cool. Yeah. Then, uh, what is it like? Aside from like the main. Mm. <coughs> Bless you. Well, Bless you. Nice. Don't worry. I'm. <coughs> I'm feeling this under a little bit. Weather changes. Yeah. My my uh. 
My mouth is so dry because I'm fasting today. <laughs> Talking. Oh, man. No, I appreciate you for doing no, this. No, of course. Know? Thank you for having me in this beautiful month. It's beautiful. Yeah. Too. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm saying, so you were, you were, you got there, and then that's the first time with the director. It, like, because yeah. you were, t- I don't remember you telling me he was like, throughout the throughout the film throughout the set he was really helping you to really um build build yourself up as an actor really yeah. teaches you the more professional ways like when do you think that moment was when you like really see oh this shit is serious this is professional work mm-hmm. and like I, what i'm doing is just it's just the job if i want to be better i have to even do more yeah frankly i think it was actually in the rehearsals uh in the three week rehearsal period I went, uh, they had this huge production, um, I think it was at the, one of, one of the big studios, they had the production office and all that in uh, North London. And uh, I went in the production office and I I saw that what they normally have in production offices, they have the lead, they have the lead cast, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and their faces. And um, when I was rehearsing, it didn't hit me that I was um, I was playing the lead character in this film, of this you know huge film. So I go in the production and I see my face. I'm like, why is it one? Why is it number one? Why is it? I didn't understand. And they're like, oh, you're the like the lead lead character. And it, I think that was sort of a changing. I was like, okay, this is serious. This is not just this is not just my escape to homeschool. <laughs> like this is serious. Yeah. Um, okay. Wow. That's where you kind of like your mind shifted. Yeah, I was like, okay, yeah, I have to pull. You know, I have to do my best. I have to pull this off. Then. Yeah. This is. But then, were there any challenges, like for offset or specific some specific requirements that I had to do that you were struggling with? It took you a long time. Um. I think to be honest, one of the a lot of people ask me how was it memorizing a hundred and twenty page script like a big script, and I said to the, I responded to them I said it's um, I found it the most um, the most easy part because when um, when you embody the character, it just comes natural to you the words, um, so the the um, the thing I thought because in, in classes like I had biology I had chemistry and uh, I wasn't the I was not a good memorizer at all so my concern was is how am I going to memorize this this whole thing and um, I found that um, that was frankly one of the most easy parts of it i think the to be honest the the tough the most challenging part was um the physical aspects of it and the uh the mental uh slash emotional uh side effects after filming such a long day or when you're because when you're like the the role i had to play um of the prince he had um the bisht, which is like the Saudi costume uh, you wear over you. Now, my whole costume, you have, you know, solid gold. Um, I got it's like a black thing you wear on top of the scarf. And um, it's a very heavy costume. And when you stand up for, you know, a good 10 hours on that, and I had a sword, I had a also... You know, I had to, it's a maybe seven kg sword. So my total, I was probably carrying around uh, 15 kg the whole day, just the costume itself, the whole day. So there was, you know, the physical aspects were tough uh, for sure. Um, but I found that when I was, um, as I look back in retrospect, is... I, uh, you can't, in my, in my uh, limited knowledge of being an actor, you can't really 
embody someone else. Like you can, I think there's the, the different, the actors that, that portray different characters is, is they're portraying another side to themselves that maybe they weren't even conscious, aware of it, of that side. So that it just is bringing another side to yourself on camera. And um, for me, as I look back, is you know, only after like uh, thirty days of filming, I was like, okay, let me read a book on King Faisal. I never even studied the life of King Faisal. Uh, I we had no Arab historians on set, no one to ask questions. So I had unfortunately no one to ask questions to. I had, you know, you, obviously you have the director, but. I'm talking about like from a historical perspective, right? I had my father, of course, but um, who knew of a bit of the history as well, but um, I didn't have, you know, I didn't, wasn't able to consult with, let's say, others that could have been of much help. Um, I didn't get that opportunity. So as I look back, I was like, how is it that I portrayed the character of, or the the role of him. I don't think I did portray the role of him. I just portrayed, because how I look at it is like, okay, you have a 14 year old. He was from the desert. His father sent him on a diplomatic mission. He's hardly ever been in any battles. He's never, um, you know, he's never spearheaded any diplomacy himself. How, and then he's going all the way to a foreign country 7,000 miles away in a ship to convince the greatest power at the time, which was the British Empire, that his father is the ultimate ruler for the land as a 14-year-old. That's a crazy thing. Um, and then how I, so how I see it is, I think I was acting as a person who never was on a film set never was, you know, never spent a lot of time in the UK, never had a job. This was my first ever job experience. So uh, going there all alone, leaving my family behind, I thankfully had my father as like an advisor. But other than that, it was, I find to be, I found myself to be in a similar situation as his. Obviously his is much different, but in essence, quite similar. So I was acting as I would for myself. I don't, you know what I mean? No. Oh, wow. You're channeling, so you're channeling that, like that feeling. Yeah. As you said, that's the very, the very artistic part of it. You're an actor. Yeah. Like you don't have to know necessarily the historical background to know, okay, you know, like there's not the right way to do it essentially. Yeah. But the right way is actually the way that's in your heart and you just feel it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're right on. That turns out to be the one that got you where you where you are. You know that got you through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very nice. Did you share with anybody else that those ideas? When you I were I didn't because you know, um, you know, I only I only this only came only one two two years maybe two years after filming uh, it came to my realization as I look back in retrospect. Um. Obviously, you're acting on the on the day as you're acting. You're, you know, you're acting consciously. I'm talking from a, from a very subconscious level. That's how I see it. But consciously, yeah, you're acting as a prince. You are the prince, and that's how it is. But I think from a subconscious level, um, it was just myself, a different version of myself, and that's all. I see. I see. And and I wouldn't want to take credit of. of portraying such a great leader as such. I mean, this was the most loved uh, king, one of the most loved kings in, in the past hundred years for the Muslim world or the Arab world. Um, so, you know, it's a huge responsibility and a huge honor, of course. So, yeah. Wow. That sounds, wow. I see. I see what you mean. Like, carry that responsibility on your shoulders and honor. But speaking of history, you're saying that there wasn't any historians on site that you could ask questions of? Fortunately, um, 
I mean, obviously they consulted with historians for the project and everything, but from an actor's point of view, I didn't have that. Um, I'm talking about like a local historian, like someone from the Real or someone from Saudi Arabia at the time, a uh, professional, local working uh, in in this time period, for example. It would have probably provided some bene more benefit, but maybe it was perfect. It's, it's fine that it didn't happen. Oh, I see. I see. That was nice. It's interesting. Uh, do you think they got it right, the historical accuracies for the, uh, for the film? Yeah, they did. And... Um, uh, we had what was very interesting is they had uh, a British writer write this project. Okay. So they had a, a British writer named uh, Henry Fitzbert. He's a very talented writer. Um, to my knowledge, that was his first uh, film that he he wrote uh, that you know was on the silver screen. Um, but now he's he's writing for Netflix. He's writing for everyone. Um, he's yeah. He's doing an amazing job, but uh, very talented. And what's interesting is, you know, he's never set foot in the kingdom. So he wrote as a Britisher in London. He's never even, till today, he has not been to Saudi Arabia, I, which I can believe because he's done a phenomenal job. Absolutely phenomenal job. Um, yeah, it's very hard to sort of get it right. But I think he's he's got it. And of course, you know, this is not a historical documentary. You know, you have to have, this is a feature film, so you have to have a bit of, uh, a bit of drama, something that's not historically accurate. So like, uh, if you remember the, the relationship, the, the friendship um, and the scenes with Princess Mary mm -hmm. was not, we don't know historically if, they even met maybe they met but other than that you know there's nothing you know so there had to be some sort of obviously some sort of fiction for the historical project to add more sauce for the film but um oh, i yeah. see but then okay but speaking of the history now we're here then yeah do you mind breaking it down for those who are listening that might not have a total idea of yeah. what the key, the historical context of the film was about? Yeah, 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 of course. So, uh, Born a King tells the life of a young boy from the desert. Um, his father was ruling a region at the time in the modern Saudi Arabia. And you had different, um, you had different actors at the time. You had the Ottoman Empire. This was on the crisp of the world of World War One, 1919. You had uh, different entities uh, competing for power and control in that in the Arabian Peninsula. So, hence, uh, this story tells uh, the the story of a young boy uh, on a diplomatic mission to the United Kingdom to convince the greatest power at the time, the British Empire, who control, you know, they say that the, the sun never set on the British Empire at the time. You know, they they had India, they had all sorts of, you know, different countries at the time that they, they had control over. Um, and, and the story is about a young boy going on this diplomatic mission to convince Churchill, to convince uh, the King of England the foreign secretary of the time, that his father is the ultimate ruler for all of Arabia. And he was able to secure, help secure the formation of the kingdom, of the modern kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So I don't know if any other stories at 14, you know, on this undiplomatic mission to convince. I, I, I'm yet to come across any. So, from a, from a purely um, human point of view, this is a crazy story that everyone um, should watch and, and can learn from and can probably inspire as well, the young kids that watch it. When was it released? It was released in uh, 
September of uh, 2019 okay. on being Saudi National Day. Oh wow! Yeah, it was it was September the first. 23rd. It was released in theaters. In theaters. In Saudi. Yeah. So at the time there was only a handful of cinemas, maybe under ten. And it was released. It was the most. Uh, it was the you know uh, number one box office in the kingdom and in the Gulf nations like you have UAE, Kuwait, and um, Bahrain. Uh, so it was the number one um, box office film and. Um, in 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 at the time, it was the most successful uh, golf produced project at the time, and um, it was sort of the kickoff to the Saudi film industry. Um, because you know it was sort of a bold, very bold statement that you know, because when you make a twenty one million dollar feature. And if you're just distributing in, let's say, the Arab world, you're not going to make your money back. You're not going to make. So this is this was more of a project that sort of launched the Saudi film industry. It was a launch, and um, and now you have so many productions happening in Saudi Arabia. You have a lot. You have uh, you know. Saudi Arabia's box office, uh, the last time I checked, was, you know, um, on par with Italy's box office. So, um, and that was two years ago. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's close. It's, it's going to, it's projected to hit billion prior to 2030. Okay. Well, that's really nice. On an annual basis? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, so there's a huge sort of, opportunity for filmmakers now in the region so does yeah. that mean that you can like anybody can go produce films still in saudi before that correct. wasn't the case correct so um so now there's entities established in the kingdom okay so when we filmed there's no such thing as regulation to film a film um not we had so much trouble bringing the camera equipment into the into the the desert essentially because it was stuck in at the you know at the border control and all that and um, it was very difficult to do so but now there was a time that you could not even bring in like professional cinematic cameras now what's the time how long it takes it's, it's much more it's a much more smooth process because now you have the saudi film commission and you have um, different entities. You have in, in Saudi Arabia in the Saudi film industry. You have um, the Red Sea Film uh, Festival. You have different entities that are sort of um, paving the uh, infrastructure of the Saudi film industry. And um, yeah. yeah, that all happened since 2019, or like it was it all coming together. Since, um, so they. The, the first ever cinema, the cinema ban was uh, uh, was sort of un, like the ban was up, uplifted in 2018. Uh, cinemas, I think, came in around uh, 2018, late 2018-ish, I think, yeah. Um, and then we released it when we wanted, when there was a... Uh, a decent amount of cinemas in different cities for the local populace to watch it. Well, so what was the what? When did production finish for the? Video? We finished in twenty uh, seventeen November. Oh, okay, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah. so actually, movie came out right after around the time movie bit. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh. Like it was my first semester at, mm -hmm. at university, and um, yeah. It also, I thought, yeah, yeah it was, that's a very interesting time, man. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy, man. That's crazy. Wow. So, so now, what is so? Can any movie just be like go on in theaters in uh, Saudi right now? Yeah, I mean, you have like uh, a bunch of different movies that come in. You have the blockbusters that come in. Okay. Is there like a rating system as well, like where the West has it? Yeah. So there's the General Commission of Audiovisual Media, uh, which regulates the content. So. 
they approve of the films that come in the country and they may or may not approve of, of others too. Yeah. And, yeah. It's nice. Has it been any like what what type of film has been all going on there? Has it been like more worldly film from different parts of the world? Yeah, you or, have um you have now Indian films coming in. Right. Obviously you have the Hollywood films. Um you have Indian films. Um I'm yet to see any Chinese films. Not right, yet. Right. Do you think it's a possibility? Hopefully. Hopefully we can do something. <laughs> is it uh well, what what are the concerns of anything you know? if, about bringing Chinese films? Yeah, I don't know if the, uh, there's a huge demand. Okay, Just, there's a huge demand. I would love to see that. Like, is K-pop a big thing in Saudi? K-pop's a big thing. Okay, K-pop's a big thing. So, how's like Asian culture like there? I think, um, I think the young younger pop uh, populace, the millennials, uh, I think they're, I think they were very fond of. Like, I I don't know. K-pop and all, but I think they were very fond of K-pop, and and I think they're very alert to Asian culture. Okay, it's um they're alert to it, but are they influenced? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, because like you know, like do you personally watch a lot of like different type of films or um, Asian films, Hong Kong, Taiwan? It's interesting because I I hardly watch films. I think I watch one film every two months. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. 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 So more of a just more, more of a go getter than anything. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. I feel yeah. Like... sometimes I'm like, oh, I should be watching, but uh, apparently it's better. Like you're uh-huh. as a freedom, you have to you can't consume too much. But I, I just here and there I go to the cinema, or maybe there's a film that someone really recommended me to watch. I would watch it. You know, this was one film that I really wanted to uh, which one recommend you. Mm-hmm. It's this. Uh, it's a Taiwanese film that's been very popular right now. Yeah. It's uh, it's I always call it the pig. The English one is it's on Netflix right now actually too. It's it's called Zhou Fu Fu Shanghai. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Let me let me tell you what it's about. But yeah, hold that thought. I really need you to watch. Yeah. Let's see it. <laughs> Oh wow! Well, what? What? Um, what? Sure. Two. What? S. Oh, we're back. Oh, we're back. What's up, guys? Welcome What's back. Up? Everybody, the whole crew had to go pee. It was the we we all had to go together. So <laughs> it stops when awake. Right. <laughs> Before we left, I was telling you about that film. It's called the. The pigeon, the snake, no, the pig, the snake, and the pigeon. In Chinese, it's called Zhou Chu Chu Shanghai. It comes from like a like an like ancient Chinese uh, story. But then it's like it's 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 about a person having lung cancer. Oh he and he, and he wants to. He did a lot of bad. He was a gay member, and he did a lot of bad things. And he wants to turn himself in. And when he goes to turn himself in, he realizes. It's been so long ago they forgot about him already. Oh but then there was he goes to the bulletin board. Mm. He sees his name being the third most wanted man in Taiwan. And he's like, who's the first two? And he goes and he and he makes a goal for him for himself. Before he dies, he's gonna take out the number one, number two, the, the most wanted man in Taiwan. And he's gonna do that for society and also for himself so he can be remembered in history mm. and he goes through a story of it without spoiling too this much this is a movie and not a tv show it's a movie it's a movie wow. it just came out uh, it's it's on netflix as well it's, it has been it's been like going uh it, it's very popular yeah netflix. it's been popular in the chinese speaking world and then it's been very very interesting too wow. you should check it out sometimes oh, for too. sure for yeah. sure once i get some uh, once i get and uh, Netflix subscription, <laughs> <laughs> which would probably be never. <laughs> no, but you, you need to share with me that film. Um, oh yes, that's a beautiful. Uh, if you can send me your Netflix password. Oh, you don't. Need to. <laughs> you know this website is Zoe Chip. No, you know Zoe Chip. You know Zoe Chip has like the biggest. Probably should not be mm-hmm. advocating pseudo illegal websites. But it's like you know those website where you go in and technically you watch all the movies. Mm. Yeah, it's like it's like and then you just go there and you watch every movie in like 4K yeah, yeah, and yeah. Blu-ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The illegal streaming websites. I'm against those, but 
But that's... <laughs> I should not be advocating illegal <laughs> streaming to like yeah, some <laughs> producer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> 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 Trying to put us out of business. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but you get really good Google ads, you know. So you get the best no, Google we, ads. We don't get the money for the Google. <laughs> 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 those illegal pirates take the money from the people that have it. How, how do they do it how do they I find think, such how do they get the most 4k sources good question, you know a good question honestly i think there's some softwares um they one person does have a netflix subscription that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> and um there are softwares where you can get through the the firewall or of Netflix and but, and actually download it okay, or okay. or at least screen record. Okay, okay. They have some good songs. Because I don't know if you back in the day, like when we first started watching movies yeah. back in Asia, yeah. as well as in China, mm-hmm. we have to go to this website called Dian Lui. It's oh. a electric. Uh, yeah. did, did you guys have it in Hong Kong or Taiwan? Dian Lui. Yeah, you know, like the one, no, no, like the website where you go to download the torrent for all movies, you know. Mm. Yeah, man, <laughs> knows what I'm talking about. Did the same thing. It's like you go there, yeah, and then it's all 4K, man. So you know, it's like I used to do like, um, yeah, like it was way back, right, yeah. 2000. I, I would download these movies, yeah, and I would put, I would burn it into CDs, and that was like me, like grade five, grade six, you know. Uh-huh. And I like sell it in school, you, you know. Would what I'm sell it. I was selling it in school. Oh, wow. But it was just like, hey, this is the new Percy Jackson, you know. This is ins- oh, like the Hollywood movies. Yeah, because you know sometimes not all movies make it to China. Like yeah, yeah, China has course. to yeah, select yeah. some movies. Mm-hmm. So then there's movies that like everybody know we're talking about that like, you see on the internet, yeah, but you yeah. can't go to the can't theater. Go watch it. Yeah, yeah, because it'll still be and popular. You sell it. I used, when, I, when I was in school, but hey, man, it's just a CD, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How much did you sell it for? <laughs> no, I was like, I was like, well, five yen, which is like a dollar, you know, it's like the cheapest, okay. just burn still, CD, yeah. you know. But then I'll send it to my parents, but hey, man, this is, I make the CD, you know. <laughs> and and, and how, how how far could one dollar go in China? Like, it wasn't that like, much. Like, no, okay, let's, much. like Canadian. Okay, so the, the Canadian dollars like, might take like. Like back then, like buying power, like a dollar, you buy, yeah. you like five thousand, like five dollars, like, like one dollar. Five thousand, you sold it for five thousand. Yeah. No, 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 like for five dollars, like five five dollars. Oh, you sold for five dollars. So sold it for five dollars. Yeah, okay. so like five dollar Canadian. Like five dollar Canadian back yeah. then. Yeah. Also, you were, yeah, you were making money. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, like then, then so like, have you heard of Soldier Boy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you yeah. know, Soldier Boy, yeah, yeah. crank that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kiss me through the phone. Yeah, yeah. you know, like yeah. Soldier Boy used to be the official. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows yeah. this. Like what? Do you, do you know, like Kiss me through the phone, Kiss me through the phone. You know that song? Yeah, I know that song. That it's song used po- to. It's weird. It's popular even in Saudi Arabia at the time. <laughs> I don't know why. You know, <laughs> Soldier Boy was like an yeah, OG. It was, you it know, was like something else. If Soldier Boy only knew how popular he was in non in not outside of America. Oh. This guy would have been a binary yeah. by now, you know. He would have been Akon, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah but he didn't. He, I don't he, think he knew. Like, yeah, like Soldier Boy. If you're watching yeah, this, yeah, I'm yeah. telling you, man, you can crank that everywhere. <laughs> I'm telling you, bro. like, yeah, because yeah. his song was so popular. It was and the state CCT like China. We had like state like so basically yeah, every China channel, yeah. like CC Central TV, yeah. like CCTV. You had like different channel, different things, mm. and CCTV five mm-hmm. in mainland. Mm. I don't know if you guys know this, like in mainland. Like, do you guys like? No, the mainland number TCTV five was the sports channel, mm. so every sports, sports caster were on there. Yeah, yeah. And then they, Soldier Boy was so famous, they would play Soldier Boy "Kiss Me Through the Phone" in, during in the, the NBA and in, in the in, in the during their trailer the, during their own trailer clips, you know. During their own trailer clips for their movies. No, 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 no. For uh, for for basketball. For highlights. basketball, like during yeah. the intercession. Like yeah, the, yeah. Oh yeah, God. they'll have like a bunch of basketball highlights, basketball. and they'll be uh, and kissing to the phone. You know, that's funny. <laughs> I'm telling that's you, Soldier Boy, you gotta come to China, come to China before because it's it's changing. You know, Maybe you can take him there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking Soldier Boy, this is please call me. Yeah, like symbiote will move. Yeah, man. Yeah. 
but it's different now. You know, it's, mm-hmm. you you would never imagine what they put on now. Really, like it changed. I think it was like some sort of culture difference. So, what do they put now? Is so, it so oh. after the whole illegal torrent session where like internet was like you just download things? Now they're more copyright stuff. Mm-hmm. So now they play like. Like sad Chinese ballad for basketball highlights. Sad Chinese ballad for basketball highlights. Yes, like imagine that. That's sad. That's sad. <laughs> like they'll put these yeah. very emotional but very easily well made, easy listening Chinese ballad Chinese. sounds yeah. under like someone dunking, you know. That's so like two dudes just going at it, and it'll just be like crazy. the saddest song. <laughs> that's, <laughs> so, that's so interesting. <laughs> I don't. I don't think they've gotten it right yet. Like somebody, like they went from they went from like something to editors. Is this a this is a more of a like this is a ministry of sports that is controlling the the TV channel as well, or um, is this like pro, like government led? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But before, for some like the person in charge of somebody, they probably loved hip hop. You know. Yeah. Oh, they loved Soldier Boy. Yeah. That's for sure. They used that. to play trap and they please they uh play the Soldier Boy stuff, right? Yeah. Like the more. America, whatever is popular in urban America, and now they play just very, very, yeah. Going yeah. at it. Once in there, they'll play rock, you know. Yeah. But they'll play like country, Chinese okay. north, northern, northern rock. Northern rock. It's like more like the the nomads type of, you oh. know, like the Mongolian stuff. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So does maybe they? I don't think they've they've gotten it right yet. Maybe they need some. External consultants, but they're playing. They're playing more like Chinese like, hip hop now too. Are they? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. That that makes sense. Like, like that have one. you ever heard of Chinese hip hop? No, I haven't. Mm, never. No, okay. like I must okay. have heard a snippet, or, mm-hmm. but not. Um, I haven't listened. Okay. Okay. I'd love to though. Have send, you? Okay. Send I gotta say, there's this. I gotta play you. Up. Oh my god. Yeah. Angie, do you think we can play Jialing right now, just on the phone? I gotta show you that song. Sure. So um, it's a f- it's like a new friend that I just met. Yeah. His name is Jello Rio. Okay. He's a very famous artist in China, mm. and um, he does. He's he's from like he lived. We lived in the like, the same city before. So he wrote a song, actually about. Uh, he wrote a song about this river. It's called Jialing. It's like one of the biggest river in uh, that flows through mainland China, oh. and. He wrote, and that's the river. It's very emotional because we actually, when I was a kid, um, my great grandpa, yeah, he was an architect, yeah. and so he designed a bridge that 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 built that goes through that river. That river, oh wow, yeah. Wow. And when he did that, um, when he passed away, right? When he passed away, we actually spread his bone ashes, his ashes, into that river. Oh, okay. mm-hmm. yeah. So, but then. So then, what? So when I when I play, this, so when you hear that song, man, I just want to paint you these pictures. I'd love to hear it. Like, let's just play it live oh, right now. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Like, you gotta. Oh, 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 Wow, very different. Very unique. Yeah, so it's very interesting because yeah. it's very um, it's not like the hip hop you would hear. Yeah. No, this is, you know, this is like more um, it's like more in tune. It kind of like it's it's more um, it's it's less sort of. Uh, intrusive oh okay so it's quite smooth because with the hip-hop or the uh 
it's very intrusive to your own energy right you know what i mean like mm -hmm. it's just like it's like an attack okay okay like i find that mm -hmm. um the case or it's like it's like you know the rappers are saying this is what i'm doing uh, this 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 mm -hmm. but this mm -hmm. I, i don't understand because that was mandarin right mm -hmm. i didn't understand it but it just seemed uh just seemed to be more and uh, more smooth compared to the western um intrusive hip-hop i find oh yeah it's, it's very interesting because what they're doing is they're actually fusing this, this it's more like a fusion music right yeah. a fusion different more element like native element into it you know one thing that um i think a lot of us asian artists are learning is like yeah. with 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 afro beats you know and with reggaeton and I like to see how different like commercial elements that might be more internationally driven yeah. can be fused together with more ethnic um elements together yeah, exactly. but then together create something very both ethnically uh coming from a place of like confidence in terms of like it's very unique yeah. but also it merges with the commercial framework mm -hmm. of mu how music songwriting is being like you know when i first heard this music yeah. actually one of my great friend yeah. you know daniel yes. he introduced he introduced me this music and um it really opened my eyes to a mm -hmm. lot of different uh different different layers into seeing that and then the meeting jillario himself yeah. in person and then you know listening to like he was playing a lot of his there's even more crazy music coming out as you say you know so it's like wow it's very interesting and i want to ask you this because it kind of relates um, first and before i get to that you know the uh mandarin mandarin accent that he had i felt it was a sort of anglicized a bit is that was it or was it pure like normal accent wow wow it's it's That's why I know you went to dialect school, bro. You like you did dialect um, studies yeah. with like the acting coaches, yeah. you know. It's his accent. He's actually using a, a like a dialect mm. from our region, okay. like the more southwest region. Okay. So you know, like in Mandarin, let's say it's very tonal, right? Yeah. But like in our region, when we speak, it has more. It's more rhythmic in essence. Mm. So it's like, like in China, in Mandarin, might be like ni hao ni zai gan ma. Yeah. Like what are you doing? Hello, yeah. it's Anthony. Yeah. Anyhow, the guys. Yeah. So be more of like da da da. da. Yeah, yeah. It'd be more of like, uh, like it has down, that. Down. Yeah, the more of like a flow in that sense. Like, more of the tonal flow. But from where you're from, it's more of a tonal flow. No, where I'm from is more so like it's more more rhythm. I would say more rhythmic in that sense. Okay. Like less less of a tonal flow, but more of less. like more of like uh. I don't know. Well, how would you say that? You know, like I'm not sure if. Yeah. No, like I, I don't know. I, I sense, um, like, uh, sort of like, um, like when you hear that as a Chinese, um, would you say that? Uh, like, do you know where he's from? Oh yeah, yeah. He's from Chengdu. Chengdu. So that's very next to where I'm from, okay. Chongqing. Yes. Okay. Now, would you? Say that's because I, what that would you say that's a normal uh, t accent within his region, or I would say it's like yeah, it is, it, it is, is, it okay. is, it is. But that's crazy. For the first time listening to it, you can pick it up, you know, because it's I don't, yeah. it's, it's not a a new detail, but it would definitely it's it's not if you don't speak the language, yeah. it's hard to really see yeah. that. Mm -hmm. no, I'm glad you share that with me. Thank you. Uh, oh yeah, no. I wanted to ask you. Um, follow up was um, why is it that I I don't know like the China like because I know you're working on this at Symbio. Mm -hmm. You know, there's one point one billion Chinese now, or one billion one point. I think of the billion. Yeah, 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 yeah. So why is it that I am so less exposed to Chinese culture? <laughs> Although there's so many Chinese in Canada at my school, is it is it because I don't know? Is it one? Is it I want to ask you? Is it is it rather okay? The the Chinese keep their culture within themselves and don't really share it with others, or because I'm not I don't know I I have like even on media like is even on the media like it's 
it's hardly ever like you know like for example let's just maybe let's let's go from a third perspective here like you when you're on instagram or when you're it's um uh, or let's say social media and even day-to-day life in person are you exposed to the muslim or the islamic culture or arab slash islamic culture I think for me, because I'm more aware of it, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But for example, like on social media, would you see people, for example, maybe you might get someone praying. Does that happen to you? You Not... might see someone praying on social media, like there's a video of someone praying or at the mall. Do you ever get these? Not much so, Not much. but I get like, depending on something I'm following, I get like, let's say, I get global affairs news, essentially, you know, so like, I don't know what's happening in that region or like, it'll be like funny videos, Mm, you know? Yeah. I see get more Indian funny videos than anything. You know, Indians make the funniest videos in a lot of ways. Um, But I think, I know what you mean, you know, and to answer your question, it's honestly, it's, 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 uh, it's a complicated question, but to put it very simply is that, um, Frankly, you know, there's due to various reasons, right? Um, whether it be internal or external yeah. or historical or um, yeah. or reasons yeah. or rather just exposed exposure yeah. that a lot of times, you know, Chinese people sometimes is very, it's, it's, it's unaware of, of, of the, of the, of the, greatness. of the culture, okay. of the culture. A lot of times, you know. Oh, they're unaware of the culture itself, or are they unaware that it's something unique to this world? They're unaware. Majority, I would say, the common people. Um, unaware. They're unaware of the culture and how it. How it has shaped, you know, how it has transcended and then now, then, and its roots, essentially, you know, cause you gotta look at it as this, right? Um, what are you speaking? We speak of the Chinese culture. You're speaking yeah. what I call the, the Hua civilization, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I think I mentioned to this before. Yeah. I call it that instead of like Chinese, like usually actually the Hua is, it stands for, it means it's actually come from Zhonghua. Mm-hmm. Zhonghua is actually the culture that, um, that I think you're referring to, mm-hmm. but, um, I'll take Zhong means middle. And Hua has this more philosophical, yes. connotative, like kind of like meaning to it, mm. right? So I'll take the middle out of it because I think it's unfair to other countries yeah. that are. It's more like relativity in that sense. Yeah. So if you say it's Zhonghua, then if then then always there has this sense of superiority or nationalism mm. to it, be like something in the middle. But then to back that, you know, Islamic center, that's the middle. You know what I mean? So it's like. It's relative in that way. So, what this fossilization really is is like the, it's it's the, it's countries who shares similar heritage, historical heritage, and also culture and philosophical culture and the way of life and the way of language, uh, through throughout history, in 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 that in that in that region in, in modern day, let's say mainland Asia, right, from and also south part of Southeast Asia. And also to some parts of the peninsula, mm. right? Uh, divided now by nationalism, mm. um, and it's 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 tough to, because I would say it's unaware because just like let's say for example, uh, the, the easiest example that I make to somebody from the Muslim world is that imagine you're um, you're from you're from Saudi yourself. Mm. You have somebody from UAE. Mm. Because somebody that might be from Syria, Correct. right? They're from three different countries. Correct. Because from the Muslim world, yeah. that's common understanding. Common. You guys have something independent and unique as a civilization. Yeah. That's another understanding. Yeah. It's like okay, we might be from we might be separated by different countries, yeah. but on the bigger humanistic yeah. or the civilization, we know that there's okay, there's the Western civilization, there's us, mm-hmm. and there's the Asians, there's the Indians, there's oh. different entities, but we are this one thing. Oh even though it's not the same country but for right now for us it's like we're still unaware that oh we're actually more we're actually similar from to vietnam and to korea and to japan 
and then than to and then anybody else you know like we we still don't know a lot of people because of what happened in the last couple hundred years it's unaware of the cultural and the historical similarities that we share and know and essentially coming from the same identity right mm -hmm. using the same uh writing system for example or having the same um philosophical principles that guide us through our way of life and our our cosmology our view on on the universe and on something more spiritual mm -hmm. This whole perspective that we call that we naturalize it as being Chinese is actually it's to me it's very dangerous in a way to because it limits other it's for example right like um like you know like 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 with Iraq and Iran or for example you know like countries that might be divided I know bring these up they might be even you know like what I'm talking about because yeah. I don't know the situation and there's so many more minute things happening mm -hmm. but a more broader situation is that you know it's it's like um then it's it's like what's happening with um like this understanding of China and Taiwan mm -hmm. you know cuz China Taiwan obviously Taiwan also uh Taiwan also got like around just got like 5 minutes left oh, we but have five yeah, for the for for the memory card. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 That's established. It's common knowledge. Uh, but what's happening right now? There's more political, social, and historical reasons that is that is shaping identity, right? So I guess you raise a really interesting question on identity, mm -hmm. and identity is something to do with a lot to do with culture, right. and this and this fact that you're not seeing this culture being blossomed mm -hmm. throughout around, around you, even though you think there are so many. Yeah. People look like me has to do with some of the factors I just told you about. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think I think I guess what we can do right here is what I what I also want to do is to spread the awareness of this identity, right? Yeah. This shared heritage mm -hmm. is that you know just taking from my Muslim brothers, yeah. you know, it's like we might be bounded by Nash by nation states, right. but which has to do political reasons mm -hmm. than anything else, but on a more humanistic. Um, cultural level, yeah. there's something that binds us together mm -hmm. that differentiates us from another group of people. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't, just because it does so, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong or bad to it, but it's it's a fact. Yeah. And the better we can realize that, mm -hmm. the more we can have this renaissance mm -hmm. and dis rediscovering our identity. Very interesting, mm -hmm. because that's exactly what's happening in the Arab world right now. I think there's this um, surge of from um, cultural res renaissance that's occurring in Saudi Arabia at the moment as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think um, the West shined for some time now, and I think the East were, were reaching it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, that's um, very interesting. Like, what type of cultural renaissance are you speaking of? It's like, um, I think, like, you know, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, what's happening is, is um, momentous. Um, with the Vision 2030, uh, there was a Ministry of Culture that was uh, established, and they're doing so much work uh, through many different facets, architecture, literature, uh, even through like horse racing. Um, it's like something um, that was suppressed. Um, from the people, uh, you know, uh, is now blossoming once again. So it's it's beautiful to see this um, this 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 uh, renaissance happening in the Eastern world, and I think it's happening, like you mentioned, it's going to be happening through what you're doing, and hopefully, what I am to do too, we can we can be maybe a means to this greater cultural. <laughs> um, renaissance. That's Great. beautiful. Renaissance. That's beautiful, man. I love that. I would okay. So we're running low on time. I would because you know I ask all my guests this is that um 
if you have a message for the future, mm-hmm. what would you what would you like to say? For the future, mm-hmm. for myself in the future, for the future, it could be anything. I would say for maybe both. I think we're at a. I think we're. Um, I think in every moment we have a choice to be uh, at peace or at war, and I think that starts from ourselves. So if we decide to be peaceful to ourselves today, we will hopefully be peaceful in the future as well. That's beautiful. Thank you. It's beautiful, man. Well, the, there we have it. <laughs> I'm Darren Abdullah Ali, my dear brother. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. We cut it. Yes. Thank you. Planning happened at the perfect time. Oh yes. Oh yes. Thank you. Wow, wow, thank wow. Thank you for this platform. Woo, thank you, everybody. Thank you.